Well, it's my privilege this morning to invite Paula Hildebrand to come as she shares part two of our Reset series. Um, most of you should know Owen and Paula. They are leaders in the church. They also lead a life group. And if you've been married, you may have participated in a marriage course that happened over the last few years. And Paula is a clinical social worker. And the way that I describe Paula is she's someone that has a big heart. And if, you've, if you know her and if you've encountered her, if you've sat in sessions with her as she's tried to maybe help you work through things and the messiness of life, then you'll discover this. The other day, we, Lana and I had a meal with them, and she was just sharing about um, an opportunity she got invited to to help uh, medical staff, doctors and nurses, through this COVID period. And her heart broke for what she saw, what the medical staff had to go through, what they had to deal with, because this is who Paula is. She carries a heart for God and a heart for people. And I've invited her to come and share on this topic because she has a voice in this topic. Um, God has used her um, um, recently in the media, and um, we've just seen her influence grow. And she's someone, as I said, she deals with families. This is a lot of what she does. So she's going to speak about the heart that God has for family. She's going to help, help us just look back over this period of what COVID has done and some of the the disruptions we've seen and I want to invite um, the Lord to speak through you this morning and then trust that he will continue to do something after the service so let's just um, maybe stretch out our hands as we pray for Paula and invite her up Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Father, for the word that you've put on Paula's heart this morning. And as the congregation, as hearers of your word, we do want to open our hearts up and have ears to hear what you're saying. And we know that none of us have made it in this area, that each one of our families, each one of our personal lives isn't where it needs to be. And we invite you, Jesus, as the foundation, as the cornerstone in which we build our families on. So we just pray your anointing over Paula this morning. As she shares, in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. I also invite Jesus to be part of the conversation that happens in your heart and in your head today. And Lord, I just put words to that, and I pray that your Holy Spirit stirs our hearts, that you talk to us, that you whisper to us, that you impart your joy and your blessing for family to us. This is not you listening to me, thank goodness. This is you meeting with God and letting him have a look at you and talk to you and touch you when it comes to family. And Lord, I just ask for that freedom to flow today, that your presence will be here with us. So from last week, you would have had a nice introduction from Paul about the word reset. And it's a very commonly used word at the moment where it's talking about economic or societal changes that we need to look at going forward. We need to look at resetting. We're looking at what was and now what is going to be. It's not an easy thing to suddenly have your normal ripped out from underneath you and then to try and find a new pattern of how to live. Do we want to go back to normal? I'm not so sure. But we definitely don't have the freedom to go back to the normal that we had before. Today we're going to try and hear what God wants from us as families in our reset. We're not going to talk economics or societal change, but we're going to look at what God is speaking specifically to family. So COVID came and really, oh, sorry, I got carried away. So COVID came and brought change. It was like a shock. It hit us like a cannonball. Overnight, the world changed as we knew it. Our family life structure changed, our work life, our schooling changed, our health security changed overnight. There were so many factors, and the biggest one that seemed to make the most impact was the isolation. And for many people, that gave us a deeper appreciation of family relationships. But for many people, it brought to light conflict, aggression, violence, anxiety, disorders that just came up overnight became poverty, financial stress, loss, family members passed away, loved ones passed away, health was compromised. Our older generation suffered the most under this space as they were isolated and bubble wrapped away from the people that they love. Is COVID over? Is this an end to it? We don't know what the future looks like, but we're sitting in a place at the moment which is the in-between time. 
and in between times are unsettling. They make us feel vulnerable and unstable. But it's also an incredible time for COVID housekeeping. And that was today's really about looking at what God wants to use in this time. I've worked in trauma and grief work for many years and I've seen how calamity makes us take stock of our lives. It makes us reflect on what is important to us, who is important to us, what we spend our time on, what we build, what we break. And the questions that flow around in our heads is what is life really about? How should we be doing this? And this disturbance of our pattern takes us to a place where we start reflecting and just looking at things that we might not have seen before. And this microscope, or mince, mincer in some cases people have said to me, or microfi a magnifying glass, points out both good and bad things that you're seeing in yourself and in the world around you, but particularly in your families as we are speaking about today. So what is this? This is an opportunity. This is a wonderful blessing. This is not, okay, how do we suck it up and handle this? How do we just find God's grace to get through this thing? No, this is something that God wants to use in this time to build something of more capacity in our lives over this time. Not for us, but for kingdom. It's a time to clean up, dust, fix a few things, throw out a few things, rebuild, and also replant things going into the future. Family is really God's idea. It's not our construct. We didn't create the sense of family. He gave us Adam and Eve, and they had children and brought them up, and his perfect plan was family. And as you well know, it wasn't perfectly executed, and Catherine will tell you that possibly a little bit of parent counseling and a bit of marriage counseling might have helped Adam and Eve along the way. And then God also sent Abram out on this huge adventure to find the promised land. He doesn't send him out alone on his camel or whatever it would have been he sends him out with a family around him to support him God doesn't send us out to do great and wonderful things without people to go with us to make us strong to keep us accountable to build things into our lives and then of course the perfect plan he placed Jesus with Joseph and Mary Mary could have been a single mom we know that she didn't need a husband to have, to have um, Jesus, but God chose uh, um, Jesus to be in a family. The family is the nucleus of our society. It's the center part that holds our, family, our society together. It's not the individual. Society isn't made up of a whole lot of Lego blocks that you pile on top of each other and that becomes society. It's more little units that are energy bunnies, if I can put it that way. They sustain, they're life-giving, they're enriching, they're empowering. They're also quite hard on us. They knock off our rough edges, they pull us into line, and they dig deep and make us dig deep. But this wholesome energy living unit is then interlinked with another unit and another unit and another unit. And next thing you have this living space of health called community. And that's what new creation's about. We're a family church because we believe in this life-giving connection of relationships. We'll always honor the individual and walk the journey with you personally, but we don't see you not with the perspective of those that stand around you and impact on you. This is God's way. It's also our African way. The word Ubuntu is so much part of our DNA in South Africa. I am because I am part of. Our Western culture is far more independently um, individualistic um, in structure, generally speaking. But what is God's way? What is he saying to us in this season around this health unit that he's just deemed the right way to go? All right, so COVID came. Um, none of us missed that fact. It was quite an obvious fact and it affected everybody. It acted on us, we had impact in our lives, but it sorted changing things inside of us as well. People that were hugely social before suddenly felt they didn't feel like seeing people, even though they longed for people. We were changed, something started changing inside of us. 
there's a scripture here that I've actually put down because it was very central to our life group and also to our lives personally when we went into COVID and all of us sought the Lord and as a church we were encouraged to really use this season to live out strong Christian lives. But this scripture talks about, I'll read it to you, John 16, uh, I've told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you have many trials and sorrows, but take heart as I've overcome the world. Um, I actually, after I did this slide, I realized I should have had the in in capital letters and everything else in smaller letters because it's really about in Jesus we have this. And that's the word here, in, um, you have peace in me. God was not surprised about COVID. Let me just grab a sip here. I get super excited and lose all my spit. Sorry. <laughs> God was not surprised about COVID. It didn't catch him unaware. It's also not his first crisis that he's walked us through. God has consistently walked his church and his people through world calamities, world wars, famines, oppression, holocausts. There's so many times when he has walked a journey with those that he loves. COVID has brought a deeper appreciation for relationships. There's been a reconnecting with loved ones. People are so much more in tune to connecting with the people they love. They're so more geared to it. The digital platforms have created a space where we can connect with people that we haven't connected for with years that are separated us by distance, but also maybe across our borders and away from us. We've shared household duties better. We have spent less time traveling. We've had more time in the home with the family. Really rich things. But as we mentioned before, there were a lot of unhealthy practices that came to light. The abuses. Living with your abuser within your four walls means that you can never get away. And it actually is a place where you live in permanent fear and unsafety. Family members withdrew from each other even though they were in a home together. The addictions blew up overnight. Porn addiction, alcohol abuse, gaming, took hold and filled up the spaces that should have been filled with love and joy and family connections. The families, the financial stress and job insecurity was completely destabilizing for many families as they wrestled just to keep food on the table and to pay the most basic bills I often heard people wrestling up three big costs that they had to pay out with the same little bit of money that didn't stretch and the stress that they felt in basic requirements needed for their family. There was many multiple role distress where people had too many functions to fulfill, teacher, mother, uh, employer, employee, too many roles to manage. We also felt the stress in our home just managing, adjusting to three adults working from home getting our platforms and everybody to sync the Zooms and not overhear things they shouldn't overhear in conversation. And um, my favorite was Owen sneaking in behind my laptop to drop coffee and then sneak out again. But we had to adjust to a different workspace. The biggest factor for me here was anxiety. It blew up overnight. It's still with us, it hasn't gone away. Catherine will tell you, and I don't know, if, I haven't seen Lucia today, but I know that you deal a lot with anxiety amongst the children, adults, parents, people are feeling such a high level of anxiety and it hasn't come down, even as our numbers of COVID have come down. If anything, we're seeing more destabilized behavior coming out of it, a real pandemic of anxiety. I want to say that God knows this. He knows everything about you. He knows what it's been like for you to walk through this COVID time. He's not surprised and he's not caught sleeping. He knows your heart. He knows where your pain is. He knows where you ran out of yourself and you weren't enough. He knows the sweet joys when something happened that was meaningful to you and only you know it was special. God knows and he's got a plan and a purpose to meet every need that you have in your life. He whispers from his word, great stories of love and promise. He shows us in the love of Jesus how he loves us. 
And then he gave us the Holy Spirit. And this is so significant. When Jesus left, he made a lot of fuss about leaving the Holy Spirit and what that meant. And I don't know if we all always appreciate it. But facing what we're facing now, embracing the Holy Spirit is central to our way of survival here. And then he also gave us the gift of family. So what is family? Who is family? Is it the husband and wife and 2.2 children? No longer. That's not the norm any longer. It might be a single mom with children, a single dad with children. It might be a same-sex marriage. Oh, sorry, Paul, I forgot this about this thing. Um, it can be no children. It can be a widower and her friends sharing a house. It can be multi-generational, and it can be multi-racial or multicultural. It doesn't have to be a blood tie. I know church family and Christian friendships can be so close, sometimes closer than our biological family. It can be adopted granny. Marie Claire's adopted granny. Or a roommate. In John 19, 27, Jesus actually is hanging on the cross. I mean, I just love this moment. I cannot imagine his excruciating pain, but he looks at two people that he loves. He looks at his mother, and he looks at his best friend, and he says, John, this is your mother. Mom, this is your son. Because he didn't want the people that he loved not to be loved and cared for. And in his worst moment, he gave family to people that he loved. It can be anybody. My life group is my family. So grateful to see your faces today. I would, if someone asked me the definition, I'd say anybody you love and anybody you live with. And COVID, we sometimes don't live with our family. And unfortunately, sometimes there's no love in our family. A different season. So who is your family? Who is the Lord called to be your family in this time? Who are the people that he's added, much like he did to John? Who's he added to your space as your family? Because this is also something God calls us to, is to embrace in that loving space. One of the most beautiful parts of family is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and us. And we get to be the kiddies. We should get punished a little bit more, but we don't. We get loved a whole lot more. There's amazing power in families. It's it's an incredible plan of God. It's not a mistake. It's not like, okay, Liz, how do we structure this? It looks normal. I'll put it into nice order. He comes with a plan. And the plan is because we're stronger when we're together. He does not send us out like Abraham on his own. He sends them in a family to go out because we're stronger together. We're part of. You ask any single person that walks into church alone compared to when you walk in with a family. You feel a little bit, even though you love this family and you're used to church, walking in and doing life, sitting down in a restaurant on your own. These are times where you can just have a little feeling of what it's like. I don't know if we sit in restaurants much anymore, but you know what I mean. We are stronger together. And this whole thing of synergy, it's a term that we're very familiar with in the work environment. But what it really means is that we all bring pieces of strength, or like a blob of strength and resourcefulness and qualities into the mix. And putting them all together somehow is much bigger and more influential and more dynamic than if we took those blocks of things and just pile them onto each other. It's more than the sum of the resourcefulness of the people. And that is what family is about. We bring different things. We bring different strengths. And we draw from each other. I draw from own strength in lots of ways, and he draws from mine. He might have a complexity done in the relationship of one of his colleagues. We'll have a conversation. I'm working on a workshop with business people, and I need his view on decision-making. Okay, those are just normal things, but we're drawing from each other. And I am better and more because of the sharing of that information. Families protect each other. You look out for each other and you keep each other warm. I love the the term warm and fuzzy. It didn't happen by accident. When we loved, we feel warm and fuzzy. It's a real thing. It's not a silly thing. These are things that define what is healthy in that, that bubble that God has put us in. When there's tenderness, we can grow more, we can learn faster, and we can heal faster. There's more strength in that space. 
it stabilizes us, it empowers us. And this is the part I really want us to hear, that when we are emotionally at peace, when our family really works, that's when we can hear God better. There's a quietness that comes in and a settledness that allows us to see and hear God free from the noise of our own lives. And it allows us to hear other people. We hear our family's voices, the people, our pastor speaking into our lives. We hear things more clearly. And we also hear the Holy Spirit in a more tangible way. We have to be light on our feet in this season. We have to hear the Holy Spirit more now than we've ever heard him before. And it also prepares us for kingdom. So a lot of people think peace is when everything is sorted, all the ducks are in the row, um, everything's together. That's actually more controlled. That's not peace. Inner peace and peace in the family is that we feel the sense of contentment and joy and stability while the chaos goes around us. That is what the peace that we're talking about. We will never sort the chaos, but we can sort our inner peace and our family peace. And today the challenge is building this family peace. It's peace in the unknown because of what is known in Christ. It's a peace in the unknown because of what is known in the Christ. What if you're not at peace? What if you're not in synergy? I'm very happy to be a Hildebrand because I'm very lucky that my husband's family are great people of great character and godliness. But what if your family isn't something you're proud of or feel good about? This is what this is about. This opportunity gives us a chance to reset. We get to relook at this, redefine it, to heal. And our children can walk in a journey of blessing and they will speak of being blessed by the choices that we make at this time. This is an intentional reset. It's something that we deliberately choose to do. We will all adjust to this because we're humans and we're trained to adjust. If you adjust by default, you haven't put your thought into it and you'll just go with the flow and we're not sure where that will lead to or what the outcome would be. How much more wise is it to be intentional? Afraid of the future, fear that your family is not working or you're too lonely or your work-life balance doesn't even exist. It's time to touch on the restart button. This is not a flick of a switch where all of a sudden it's sorted out and it's done and dusted, but you're touching on a starting point on a journey where you're choosing to walk deliberately on another path. And, it, and, and hoping to a better outcome. And I love this, quest, uh, this uh, scripture from Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. And I really want to encourage you to fix your thoughts on Jesus and the scriptures at this time. God has not changed anything in what he's spoken to families about in all the years. Through all the different disturbances we have, he has not changed what he says. How we apply it and the arms and legs we give to that might be different from yesterday, but his words are still the same. How we do this reset is to really look deeply into his word. Look at the life of Jesus, which I'm really glad is our next series. This is the ad break, just in case you're worrying. But this is a time of us really looking at who Jesus is and what was he saying to us. And then once again, I cannot say it enough today, it's leaning on the Holy Spirit. We need to bring this more into our family lives. It was something that happened a lot in the 80s. And if we can get to a place where we get used to talking about the prophetic, talking about hearing the Holy Spirit or being led by the Holy Spirit, if that's more part of our conversations in our family, how much more will we not hear the Holy Spirit and act in an empowered kind of way? So the scripture that I want to focus on today is from Colossians 3. Why I chose this one is predominantly because um, oh, there's so many scriptures to draw from, from the whole scriptures tell us how to live our lives. But this scripture looks at moving away from our old life 
and then lifting our eyes off the ground in front of our feet to actually lift our eyes to Jesus and start looking at him where the things are happening around us. And I really like um, the message. I, I was going to read the whole chapter to you, but I'm going to leave that to you to read in your own time because it speaks about getting in step with each other and walking in a rhythm with each other and living in harmony and it speaks very practically of what life together can be like with the direction of the Lord so the first one is to clean up your house we've spoken about needing to do the COVID housekeeping to do the sweeping and the dusting out and the emptying out of things but it's a very powerful opportunity to really get rid of stuff, make things right. I'm going to read the scripture for you. So put to death the sinful nature, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshipping the things of this world. Because of these sin sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Families play such an important role with this whole dusting cleaning exercise. I take a sip here deliberately because now I'm exposing myself, so <laughs> catching my breath. But I've got a real life experience of this, where family can actually help us dust out our corners, help us to be more accountable and to do things better. There was a time that I wanted to go on a study angle, trajectory, and it was a difficult time for our young family. And Owen, in great love, said to me, Paula, you're being selfish. And it cut deep, but I heard his words because he was speaking life over me and you're speaking life over my family. And he helped me dust out things that needed to be dusted out. Let our families help us with this journey. Let us embrace the, the counsel of our family as we work through this. And also be brave enough to say to someone in your family, I think you need to look at your work ethic or whatever you need to say. Let's use this time as families to sharpen up who we are. I also want to remind you that your wrongdoing in a family, if you do something wrong, your family are not at all exempt from the contamination of your wrongdoing. Whatever you do, even if it's in secret, will play out in the family. You're too close. The little bolikis of the family that sit together touch. As the one is affected, it affects the others. A very good example for this, unfortunately, is the secret addiction of porn and how that might affect the family and the marriage bed. Very real challenge in this time. The good news is God's here to help with all those things. Oopsie. Gentle conversations. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience so just like our wrongdoing kind of gets filtered out to our families so do these qualities and these are principles that we approach our families with that we deliberately choose to act in when we're with them and there are certain behaviors that come out of this that I want to just give specific comments to you and this is around talking and listening and engaging I really want to encourage you to listen and speak less the idea of listening to someone is to understand, not to get ammunition for your side of the argument, and definitely not just to get to a way to prove that you're right. It's about understanding the person. We have to question before we accuse. We need to really give of ourselves into that space by being patient and tender. And in that tenderness, life grows and relationship grows, and trust is built with those qualities that we've just mentioned there. We all know this one, and it can work exceptionally harshly in any environment in our homes. 
Don't make, sorry, make allowance for each other's faults and give everyone, oh man, sorry guys. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. This making allowances for each other's faults is a very significant thing. We can't be so harsh and hard on people. Give space, give grace. Understand that it's hard for someone to be on time sometimes or to manage something that they need to do at home. But some things come more naturally to, other, to some people than to others. To give grace, to know where our challenges are, where our natural flaws are, and to give grace in it and to give forgiveness. People don't mean to be nasty. Give them a little bit of grace in it. But what if they do mean to be nasty? What if they say something deliberately to break and hurt and diminish? Then we give them another chance, because we're family. And then we give them a third chance and a sixth chance, because we're family. We keep hoping and working towards growing new things in each other. We don't give up and start condemning people, but we give grace. But for the person that has been given another chance, I pray that you don't abuse it, that you understand the high price it costs for people to give you another chance, to open up and trust again. Don't abuse the generosity of the love of your family. Criticism diminishes us, but wise counsel builds us up. Pick which way you want to go with this, but know deliberately what you're doing. The minute you go critical, you are breaking. And I think we need to wise up in how we manage ourselves in our environment. Correction builds strength. I love this point. Don't we all? Above all, close yourselves with love, which builds... Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. The words that stand out for me are binds us and perfect harmony. Isn't that a wonderful thing? The more we love, we feel connected. I felt connected seeing people I loved here today. I feel connected when I'm with my family and I've had all five of us together. Harmony, that sounds like a whole lot of voices, different voices, all singing the same song together. But what if love is dead? What if you feel like you feel nothing? You're numb, you don't love your family, you don't feel that connection. And you look at the person that you married or you are with and you don't feel anything. I want to challenge you to look for beauty, to look for what is praiseworthy, what is honorable, what is godly. And you start using your words to note those things and say it to the person. And in communicating that to them, they hear your value of them beyond their faults and their inadequacies. And they start responding differently to you. And before you know it, love starts to bloom again. But it's a conscious decision about where you want to put your mind and your eyes. What if your love was bruised? It's not dead, but you're bruised and you're hurting. Talk. I've had so many people say to me, but I was so upset. And how can they see me upset and not do something? And my point is, well, if you're upset, you say something. Um, it's not fair to expect other people to read you and try and respond. Tell people what you need. Be specific. Don't get cross because they didn't tell you they were working late and they came back late. Of course you can get cross, let's just be honest. But you can <laughs> deal with it a little bit differently rather than blowing up and be um, destructive. You can say, please won't you give me a message when you leave the office because it just kills me when I worry, worry about you driving home. Ask for what you want. Say what you need. A little bit, little bit more direct helps. Actively encourage each other. Let the message about Christ in all its richness, hey, aren't those words lovely? In all its richness, fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. So there's two parts to the scripture. The one is the teaching and the praising and the thanksgiving. It's good for family to teach each other, to have common sense, to give advice, to lift up, to stretch our minds, um, to throw in unusual questions into the family debate. These are good things. 
but it's also good to give thanks, to keep turning our eyes towards Jesus. The most amazing thing about giving thanks is that it takes our eyes off all the things that are not right and not good and not great. And it makes us see the goodness of God and what he's doing. And the more we do that as a family, it lifts our eyes up and we are changed by thanksgiving. Besides the fact, it is so nice to give thanks. It's so nice to worship God. And it's a joyous, love-filled kiss that you give to God. It is a special thing to do this as a family, to kiss God together as a family. Husband and wives, okay, everyone starts squirming at this time, normally, but it's not like that at all. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. I want to start with husbands because I am in charge today, so I can. <laughs> but husbands, love your wives. Um, for many men, that seems like a silly thing to say because of course they love their wives. But I'm talking about love your wives. Be active, be outward, be demonstrative. Be generous. Don't be schnoop about it. Well, I told you I loved you on our wedding day. That's never going to cut it. It's a regular sharing of your love for that partner. It's showing her or him, because this can also apply to women as well, how to love actively and then not to treat them harshly. For many women, um, the harshness makes us withdraw our love take away our affection and if there's a harsh thing said it's very hard then to open up to love again so bearing in mind that husbands when you want to address something with your wife do it in love and kindness the minute you are harsh she pulls away from you and it's going to be a long time before she wants to come back to you and it's quite hard to build those bridges and if there's enough harshness those bridges are never very strong okay so now the women do you love your husband like he's been a precious gift entrusted to you from the maker of who he is? God loves your husband more than you do. He's handed him over to you as a precious gift. And God's going to ask you one day, have you loved him more than anybody else on this world could have loved him? And that's what you're going to have to answer to. It's a difficult one to answer on some days, but it's a real depth of serving the Lord as you serve your husbands. And as husbands and wives share mutual love and respect, as they create that rhythm within the home, it is seen by the family. It's verbalized, so it's not just a subtle thing, it's a real tangible thing that the family can see. And if you are struggling to work on your own marriage, love your husband and your wife well, because you are actually working on your children's marriage. They get to watch you, and you are sowing seeds into generations of marriage and there's more of a reason for us to demonstrate the truth and authenticity of love in the family like that the, the adults in the home reflect kingdom and the children learn kingdom from that behavior the last point I want to make on this slide is please try and be lovable just work on it from your side too there's a lot said here about us reaching out to love Please work at being lovable and just engage. <laughs> Thanks, patience. <laughs> God loves obedience. Children, always obey your parents, for this is pleasing this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not aggravate your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear for the Lord. So this scripture is about being obedient to authority, but it's also about how the authority must respond to you. And there is a, a godliness in respecting leadership, but leaders also have to lead without discouraging or aggravating. So it's a mutual draw. Families are the center point of teaching integrity and ethics. These are central things to who God is. His character is incredibly ethical. And the family is where we train and teach this for all our children and for ourselves. We, we draw it to the fore as we engage with our families and talk on topics of relevance. 
This last point is one I really want to bring into the family discussion because it has so much significance in this in-between time that we were talking about. From COVID to in-between to whatever's next. Work willingly whatever you do as though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. A lot of people look at the scripture and they think it means, um, you know, if you're working towards the Lord, you work harder, you do better work than if you're working for people where you scarve off and you don't do the proper quality of work. That is true. That is what the scripture is saying. But it's also got another message. It can also be a caution about don't work too much. Sometimes the working too much is about pleasing people. It's about the fear of people. Job insecurity. Will I lose my job? There's a real danger that we listen to the people and work too much. We need to listen to God to work out what our work-life balance is. And this impacts family. It impacts family hugely over this time period where our work hours have been so blurred. We don't know where the day ended and where it started. And everybody phones you at any time of day or night because they know you've probably got your phone and you're available. There's no work hours anymore. So what does this mean about work-life balance? It's, we often think boundaries is by putting like brackets around work. So this is work eight to five or whatever the bracket is that we're talking about. But brackets and boundaries aren't about that. It's actually about safeguarding this space. It's another block of space that God wants us to use for family, for recreation, for self-growth, for, for reflection, for meditation, for healthy practices, for outdoors, for looking after your house phoning relatives that you care about, ministering to others, engaging with others. The boundary is protecting this gap. And it's an empty gap for a lot of us because it's, we don't know what to put in it. Let's ask God what we should put in it. Ask him what you should be using in this space. But you don't have the space unless you bracket the space. God will give you the wisdom of where that is. And I know, I mean, Katie works all over the world. Her timelines and work hours are all over the place. This is not a setting. There's no way in scripture that says you only work daylight hours. There's no way that says it's eight to five. There is a scripture that says go to the Lord in all things. And you go to him and you get wisdom about where's work and where's this space. And this space, God's got a lot of good things waiting here. We often feel that this conversation is to protect the families, that the families can have more access from whoever's working too much. But this space is actually to protect the person that's working too much. This is to keep him and her and the little one that's studying or doing school or writing matric. It's to protect them, to give them a sense of being nurtured and loved by their families, to be supported and invigorated by their families. That is the space that God feeds each one. If we don't have it, how we operate outside of our families is less than. I can promise you that because that's God's law. Without that space being in your life, you will not be optimum in any other space in your life. It's the way the Lord has decided. We need to ask the Holy Spirit how to walk, work smarter. I have incredible amount of favor with work. I'm terrible at marketing and I'm being very grateful with, by miracle upon miracle that I get clients because I've learned to partner with the Holy Spirit. I trust him. I know that he will become, so he works smarter with me. And that's a daily journey of working that one out. Rest is an important part of effective work. It's a requirement from the Lord, but it's very much part of quality living and real living I've got some other tips I just want to chat through here. I'm going to move away from Colossians 3. I've done, this was from the New Living Translation, not the message. The message was what I encourage you to read at home. Um, some of these tips here I just want to touch on because they really are practical things that you can do for family, to enrich family and to make them more wholesome and sustaining and more fun to be part of. People are lazy. We don't contribute to conversations. We don't think of fun things to do. We don't put down what we're doing to do something with somebody else. I encourage you to give of yourself, to share your ideas. Talk about your life. Talk about things that matter to you with those are people that you're living with, that you're engaging with. Eating meals together. This is something that we miss so much in our life group. If we're together ever, 
The, the biggest complaint, when we go online at least, the thing that people miss the most is not my awesome preaching, it's so sad to say. They miss sitting around and eating very simple mediocre food around a table together. No, not mediocre, because sometimes Tan cooks, so we can be really fine. <laughs> There's that sharing and connection that comes from sharing a meal. I sat with someone uh, recently in my practice that said that they haven't eaten as a family, a young guy, for about five or six years. They live in the same house but haven't sat at the table. I think there's something lost about not sitting together. If from very young it's a norm that you sit down and engage and talk, no other distractions, and it becomes a time of the day where people get into the habit of sharing life and sharing God. And we start our meal by trusting in God. We, we pray and we engage and we, and we um, share lives in it. Having fun and playing together is a lovely thing to do. Doing chores is a lovely bonding. Wash cars, dig in the garden, move furniture. Hey, Jordan. And then we can break bread. This is something I really want to encourage. I miss that so much from our, our big services here that often Paul used to get us to break bread in families while being together. But break bread at home, just at a meal, just, in, what's the word, informally, just come and acknowledge God and the covenant that he has with us. There's something deeply profound that happens in our spirits that we don't even understand, but it happens from breaking bread together and then praying regularly. Uh, we were sitting uh, just this last week and Ash was talking about a student that she was, just had a heart for and was worried about. And there was a little comical story that went along with it. And um, Owen said in a, almost like the Baloo the Bear comical voice, I feel a prayer coming. And he, we took hands and we could pray for this little guy. And it was something so special as a family that we could be part of the work that Ash was doing outside of the home. Telling family stories. This is a lovely one um, because you can talk about the testimonies of God. You can talk about how God has overcome before, how he's met needs before. But you're also telling the story about how to be tolerant, how to persevere, how to find courage and strength, how to find a rhythm to get through. And not everything is an awful down, disempowered, weakened space. But the stories send a message. So we do that a lot in the car and the kids will talk, ask about something and then before you know we're talking about family stories or testimonies in our own life. But I know from the stories that I've been told growing up that I feel stronger because of the people that walk before me. I feel they've given something to my journey with the Lord that has added to my life. Let our stories be about real life and real godliness. And the stories emphasize godly character and the nature of God. We need to get rid of materialism. This defines Joburg is having stuff and the latest stuff and the cool stuff. We need to get away from this. It's blurring us from the things that really matter, the connection, the simple and the natural, a walk or an oros and apple picnic. Putting away devices. This you must see how people react so badly when you say, can I have your phone for two hours? Or can I take away your device or switch off something? You swear us asking for a kidney or taking a limb. <laughs> the amount of attachment that we have to this is such that it's actually disempowering us. It's taking away from us. There's a place for this. I love devices. It works in my life hugely, and I'm going to lose my slides if I do that. But we actually get too dependent, and we need to know to put it away so that we can keep building the relationship skills that we need. We need to know how to have the eye contact to engage with someone, how to actually verbalize and talk through things, or to contribute or to give to a conversation. You can't have that unless we create the gap from devices. We need, as, as we said with the work, we need to create the space where we can learn how to do these things. And I'm finding it more and more in the therapy, I don't know if Kath feels the same, we sometimes having a lack of imagination is coming out of device in a space where people are so tuned to being passively um, entertained that they're not learning to engage of their own creativity in their own innovation in the same way. Create the space to learn the skills, to learn how to talk, so that when your children go into marriages, they are talking in their marriages and sharing their life and sharing Christ. Also get used to how you talk about God. The devices don't talk about God. You do. 
You express his character and his nature. And that's where we need to be actively drawing that skill in the fall. Eye contact and touch. We can never go wrong with that. And I want to leave you with a scripture. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. Most people would think I'd focus on love for a conversation like this. Love is a beautiful thing and it is incredibly powerful, but I'm speaking about peace because we work at creating peace. We deliberately deal with any kind of vulnerability. If you don't feel now something's bothering you, sort it out so that you can have a platform of peace. And when there is a platform of peace, that's when God can speak to you and that's when he can move in your life and that's when he can move you to bless other people. Anxiety is our pandemic, pandemic, sorry, not COVID. And peace is God's answer. A strong, peaceful, God-focused, loved-filled family is God's best for us. And that's what he's drawing us to um, in the reset. We get to do this better. We get to change the way we do things. We get to re-look at them and find God in them and find our steps and our pathways. And we get to do it with our family. We get to talk it through to them. We get to make a mistake and they help us and make us strong and do it better tomorrow. I am loved. The love from Owen and my three children, Jordan, Jen and Ash, make me feel stronger when I stand here. Paul will tell you how nervous I get doing these things, but I feel stronger because of that love. My parents, Jean and Chester and Jill, pray, praying for me as I speak here. I am stronger. My life group. My friends. I am more than me when I stand here because of the love of God and the love of family. So my challenge to you is to create a space that nurtures and grows us in our lives, that grows families in a real active way that God ordained, so that we take the arrows and send our family out into the world to make an impact. It changes the world when godly people go out. And if you go out without the love of support of a family, I fear for you. So let's do the family well so that we can send our family out into the world. Strengthen your family so that the arrows of your family members will go out into the world, impacting and changing lives wherever they go. Carrying the good news to those outside our home from the experience of God that we have inside our home. Lord, I just pray your blessing over the people here today, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you are the God of peace, that you are the Prince of Peace, and that you get to show us how to do this. You do not leave us alone to sort out our behaviors, Lord, but you walk a journey with your Holy Spirit empowering us and leading us. And I pray for every family here, Lord. I pray for peace to come into these homes, for healing to come into these homes. And also, Lord, I pray for the directing of the healthy goodness in these homes, the blessing that you have poured out on all here and those listening. I pray, Lord, that you take that blessing and you send it out, Lord. As we know you, Lord, we take that life-giving knowledge to the world. And we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will direct us the whole way. Amen.